So hello and welcome everybody to Merlini's Mailbag episode 14. This one is about how to win from behind, playing in a down position, whatever you want to call it. And <laughs> quoting Gyrocopter from Dota 1, the little, I forget what the thing is called, but they came from behind and it's not impossible. So this week's question was submitted to me, again, Merlini, actually mailbag at MerliniDota.com is where I receive most of the questions. Making sure I'm not muted. Okay. I have done that before where I've been muted. Okay. Um, this week's question. Hey, Ben. As a lower level player, in most of my games, the team that gets ahead tends to stay ahead. With each kill not only granting gold and experience to the killing side, but also removing gold from the dying side, the, mem the momentum quickly becomes too much to surmount. However, I have noticed that this is not the case in high level slash professional games. There is much more trading advantage. As a high-level player, I would like to know how your mindset changes from when you start the game level to when you find yourself down in XP slash gold slash towers. In addition, are there any common strategies or tricks that we can employ to take the game by inches in the hopes of crawling back level and turning the tide against a team snowballing out of control? Thank you so much for reading, and I look forward to your stream. So there's like a lot of like psychological aspects behind like when when you're behind, people like tend to give up way too easily blame their teammates and just like go on tilt or whatever if you start feeding but those aside there are like a few types of deficits I'm just gonna go over this pretty briefly um, before I move on to the next slide but um, so in terms of deficits disadvantages deficiencies whatever you want to call it there are static deficits which actually don't change too much unless there's like a really big event that occurs in a game which is like gold such items, uh, items including Aegis, which you can't buy with gold, um, hero experience, and tower gold. So this may happen for whatever reason. Maybe you just messed up your lane. Maybe they're better than you. Maybe you started feeding. Maybe your team started feeding. Maybe they have a better push lineup. Whatever it may be, there's always going to be a static deficit. And rarely are games like really, really close at a start. So you can't actually see the gold graph in game. Or experience graph but as you play longer and longer you'll be able to like feel it out and be like okay I know I can't man mode this guy I can't fight them or we can't five on five them because they're way too strong and as you play more and more you'll be able to realize when and when you can't take out take on fights if you still can't realize when you can't take on fights this presentation is probably not going to be too useful so this is more like a intermediate to advanced where you know you can't take fights five on five straight up um, and then I have tower gold as a separate um, bullet from static deficits because tower gold is a little bit different from other gold just because like let's say you're a carry and the opponent team is a carry 15 minutes in he has 100 CS and you have zero there's no way you can recover like the hundred creeps that he managed to get that you didn't like there's still gonna be like four or five creeps that spawn every 30 seconds the neutral camps are still gonna spawn you can't like make up for that lost gold you just have to move on and you know that you can't just like create creeps out of nowhere unless you like double stack and all this other stuff but like tower gold is kind of like banked gold like sure they may be ahead in towers but you can easily recoup that gold if there are big events that happen in the game but these are just a static deficits that you should just keep in mind you should be re you should realize that you're behind in levels or you're behind in gold or you're behind in items and whatever it may be you you're you're at a disadvantage and there and then there's these dynamic deficits dynamic deficits are pretty unique to dota um and the two main things are positional deficits and numbers numbers being like you take a fight where you outnumber them or they outnumber you so i couldn't think of a better term to put it but that's what i mean when i say numbers and these are the things i'm going to be concentrating on um and the other one that i want to talk about but i didn't want to put in either of these is like lineup like your lineup may be a little bit worse than theirs at certain points of the game, but for the most part in public games, like I don't really worry about lineups too much. I random most of the time. I usually don't have to repick, and people focus way too much on like lineups being good or bad, or our hero comp sucks. And you'll rarely hear me say that just because I think that these other ones are just much much bigger of a deal. So a lot of people just like to put lineup as like a scapegoat. Oh, we lost because our lanes suck, or, or because our heroes suck. Which is true sometimes. I acknowledge that there is the potential for lineups to be at a disadvantage, but for the most part, it's usually one of these. So, going back to dynamic deficits, say no to turtling. No turtle. In general, turtling only delays it inevitable and will not get you back into the game. 
No risk, no reward. Static deficits will eventually become insurmountable and you will lose. Static deficits being like gold and XP experience difference. And like I, I see a lot of people, they just turtle. All they, by de turtling, I mean like hardcore turtling, like five man inside up your T3s and not being able to even go out to your neutrals. If you do that, you're most likely going to lose. I'm not saying that there isn't a time and a place to turtle, but in general, you're just prolonging the game. You're you're not you're not doing anything. The gold difference is still going to be like huge. They're going to farm your jungle, all three lanes, um, everything. They're going to get Roshan. Eventually, they're just going to crush you in one fight, take your base, and just you're just going to lose the game like that. And that's not how you should approach. A deficit because if you do that you're just gonna lose they're I mean, I mean they they aren't scared at all because they know exactly where you are what you're gonna do and eventually they'll just overpower you so however keep in mind that playing smart safe and passive is not the same thing as turtling and people sometimes get that confused so what should you actually do instead of turtling so to embark on the road recovery you have to force your opponents to make bad decisions via dynamic deficits Dynamic deficits being positioning and numbers. And I'm going to repeat this because for some reason I can't bold in Prezi. So force your opponents to make bad decisions via dynamic deficits. And there's many ways you can do that. And I think it's a little bit of awkward wording, but that's the best way I could put it. So you can either do that by making them have lack of vision. You can either be uphill in a fight. You can have wards where they don't. You can use sentry wards to take out their vision. You could fight in the Roshan pit where they're clumped up. And you can do many things for for vision purposes, um, and this is why a hero like Shadow Demon in competitive play has a really big is, is a really big impact just because his shadow poison can scout for uh, vision, and then if you can see something and they can't, it's actually a pretty big deal. Which is also why like pushing is a big deal too, because the defender usually can hide in the fog, they can hide uh, like in the trees and stuff behind the tower. Whereas if you're the ones if you're the aggressor, usually you can see all five heroes. So that's that's always why pushing is somewhat puts you at a disadvantage and then uh, going along that there's also positional advantage so you can fight at choke points like around Roshan like up ramps all that stuff you can fight uphill again uh, not only is it like there's a mischance for range heroes but they can't see you at all and they're often forced to clump up for spells whether it be reverse polarity shackle shots or whatever it may be um, you can also use smoke ganks. Smoke ganks is actually a pretty big deal because um, you you they just completely take the enemy by surprise most of the time. So usually they have map control and you don't, and then you can kind of force them away from the area, whether it be your jungle, whether it be their own jungle or a lane that you really want to farm. You need to like slowly try and take control of the map and make them scared. And map control is a really big deal, but it's a pretty abstract concept just because there's no like clear place you can be but if you had that alarm going off in your head like hey i probably shouldn't be here or if they're like not scared at all and they're just like farming at your like t3 without even caring you know you can you you know where and when you have map control but you try and smoke smoke gank to increase your map control and make them scared and make them again force them to make bad decisions like pushing when they shouldn't or not being together as five um and then there's also like split pushing too. So split pushing, it seems like a simple concept. Okay, you just split, you just push along with your team. But the reason why it's so strong is because you force your opponent to either continue pushing and usually they, they, they like overextend or they don't want to. Like let's say they just took out your T2 and you have a AM or something split pushing. They don't really want to push if you're T3. They're strong enough to take a T2, but not really a T3. But if they TP back and your AM TPs back, then they're immediately 4 on 5. And if your team is smart about it, you can take advantage of this and just hop on them when when uh, they try and retreat. Or if you just have like a Keeper of Light who can just blast a wave, like the AM is actually going to push faster. One person is going to push faster than the 5 pushing against 4. So this makes your your team like make bad decisions like if you tp out one at a time somebody's gonna die and somebody's gonna get picked off and you're gonna like lose a team fight and you trade it evenly on the towers right because your split pushing is usually t2 for t2 but like the team that was behind suddenly is able to get some sort of kills just because they're in this 5v4 like dynamic deficit i want to call it um 
And next one is baiting. So baiting is pretty obvious. You have like a gyrocopter with BKB and they try and kill him and you guys are all smoked behind him and you try and just like counter gank them. So that's sort of like a positional thing. Again, it utilizes a lot of these positional advantage and lack of vision. And you can also five man Dota. So the reason why five man Dota is so strong it, and why people do it when they're behind, like let's say you're behind by 10 kills or whatever, you, you want to find me in Dota because you want to force the opponent to make a decision whether they should continue farming and extend their gold lead or actually fight you and sometimes waste their time or fight in unfavorable positions or whatever it may be five man dota is usually what people resort to in pubs or even competitive when they're behind just because you're stronger as a unit you can uh l like level deficits aren't that big of a deal and gold items aren't that big of a deal either and like one big rp or one big ravage or one hero getting caught out can easily uh make up for a lot of these differences and being five man cohesive unit will uh, mitigate most of these so if any of you guys ever play tennis or even watch tennis there's like unforced errors and forced errors so like unforced errors is just like when you fuck up it's just like okay mag had the opportunity to rp three people but he accidentally rp then blink that's like an unforced error it's just your opponent you or your opponent or whatever who is ever it's a mag that's just being bad and you can't really really rely on that at least not at a high level to come back into a game you really have to force them to make bad mistakes. You have to you have to have forced errors where you like strategize, out strategize them, out position them, out out whatever, out maneuver them in order to uh, in order to make them fuck up. Like for example, if they're pushing and you can see the mag, you can like blink on him and orchid blink sheep or silence them or spread out or do whatever. Um, and like a good player or a bad player, he's still probably not going to be able to pull off an RP, but that's like a forced error. So you really want to like force the opponent to mess up instead of just hoping they're bad and they're just going to throw the game, right? You you don't really want to want to rely on that to um, win the game. So like this is again, this is more like an abstract concept, dynamic deficits regarding like positioning and like making them outnumbered in fights where they shouldn't be outnumbered and just like wearing them thin around the map wasting their time like if they five man dota you can kind of counteract that by just wasting your time warding up and uh split pushing and just teeping out early when you anticipate the game coming so there's many other ways you can deal with each of these strategies but these are usually the strategies that people employ so one um like positional advantage i want to refer to was actually in the eastern qualifiers that i was casting i wasn't actually casting this particular game but i did cast this week so uh this is lgd versus dreams and obviously it, it sounds simple like hey you shouldn't take on four and five fights but it still happens even at the highest level of play and i'll show you how they actually made this happen so this game's actually very very close it's 29 and 19 which actually is like not that close kill wise but xp wise and gold wise it actually goes in favor of dire just because they were farming all game this is lgd china versus dreams and they're actually one set of racks down and one melee racks down so the game is like very even at this point and they have a really stacked queen of pain with scepter lincoln's hex uh and black king bar and a really stacked anti-mage on dire and they have a pretty good lineup. I'm trying to just give just a brief background of this game. And Luna is really stacked too. Luna's really stacked and Life Stealer is really stacked too. So the game was like pretty close and they're just like trying to split push. And one big mistake by either team can cost them the game. So each of them are playing pretty passively looking for looking for the other team to make mistakes. They're they're smoked up uh, trying, to for, trying to bait out this AM who's really stacked and has buyback. And they're they're like sticking together as five man because they don't want to they don't want to get picked off and they have a gem too and they don't want to fall for smoke gangs so what happens now both people are on their own respective side of the river and nakes hops inside dark seer and again the both of them are like pretty even at this point okay it's like again gold advantage and xp advantage is in favor of dire but dire has um dire has some racks down but now they they finally push past the river both teams are smoked and this is how LGD forces Dreams to like make a really awful decision. Okay, so Anti-Major is pushing up here, 
And if you notice the items right now, he doesn't actually have a TP scroll. So they, he saw them right here, but I mean, the logical thing is for them to push up mid and then maybe get a Rex and maybe pressure on if they continue forth. And Dream's like, oh, okay, we probably want to, we can probably take it faster. They don't have a T3. We're actually attacking the creeps, etc. And they think that they can TP back and defend. But if you notice, they actually don't have TP scrolls on all their heroes. They only have TP scrolls on three of their heroes, which is... I mean, what are you going to do? It's really late into the game. He needs his gem. AM needs all six of his items. But they could easily just, like, okay, blink to the fountain and get gotten TP scroll, even died or buy back or um, sold, traded his treads for boots of travel. Whatever it may be, they all have this, like, pretty, pretty big oversight. And, like, they push up the hill. Radiance and then they both use Glyph, like, right around the same time. Okay, so right now... This glyph is used, and it's like just a second after um, Dyer uses their glyph too. It's really close. Okay, so they actually beat him to the base race just just because they used the glyph, and then right now they realize, oh shit, they're going for the throne right now. Okay, and for some reason this AM does not TP back. Okay, I know part of it is because this TP scroll is actually belongs to the the AM, and Queen of Pain just like straight up jacks his TP just. Drops the gem, jacks his TP, and then TP's home. Which, I was just like, what? I thought it was actually the AM's fault that he didn't TP back, but it's actually the Co-op's fault, because Co-op just jacked his TP. So, they're already like, oh shit, we're gonna, we're gonna get thrown, we already use our Glyph, and we're gonna lose the game if we don't defend this, just because, if you look at this, they could've gone for a base race, but instead they tried to go for a Rax. If they just straight up, just like, went into the, went into the base, they might've killed it, but instead they try and TP back, and... Like, so Queen of Pain jacks his TP scroll, he TP's back, and then they start fighting, and then this anti-mage is trying to blink back from their racks all the way back to the base, and, like, that's just, like, one of the biggest, that's, like, the biggest mistake in this game. And he's, like, still blinking back. His team just gets rolled without him, even though they have BKBs, they have all these items, and he's still blinking back by the time this game ends, okay? So, pretty much at the end, they just fight on 4 on 5, which... It was really anticlimactic, but it just really shows you how, how like, forcing your teams to make bad decisions can really be at all levels of play. And I was just like flabbergasted that this happened. I expected like a man fight with like all these buybacks, but it was kind of anticlimactic. But again, like split push really shows you just like, and people can't cope with it on all levels of play. And he could have done many things. He could have. Again, went to Fountain, bought BOTs or TP scroll. You can like put a TP scroll in your stash, swap out your treads for your TP scroll, TP back, and then pick up your treads, and then you have money for buyback. Uh, he could have bought BOTs. He could have suicided to the Fountain and bought back. He could have done many many things. Picked up chicken uh, uh, TP scroll at the secret shop before all that happened. Uh, he didn't do any of those, and neither did the Queen of Pain either. They just like weren't prepared for it. They fought a five on five, and that was just game over right there. And like. It was, I was just, uh, again, it was absurd how quickly the game ended after that. But, like, again, being able to create these um, dynamic, overcome these dynamic deficits and, like, force your opponent into, like, 4 on 5, 3 on 5, all these, like, weird situations that you don't really want to be in, that's, that's part about coming back. And you really have to just make your opponent, make, force them into that. If you turtle, they're just going to have free roam and not do whatever they want and just crush you again. So I would not recommend turtling. And if you like smoke ink and it doesn't work out, or you like turtle and you like feed even more, it doesn't really matter. At least you're like trying, you're trying to win. And it, again, if you just sit in your base, you're just like, okay, I'm going to lose. And I want to, some people like really care about their KD for some reason. I don't know why, but it's like, oh, I don't want to die. I don't want to feed. But if you say you're sitting in your base, you're going to lose. So I recommend like trying out different stuff, whether it be split pushing, uh, trying to f push out lanes when you like think they might gank you um farming like risky areas like i saw one team like 10k go behind and they like smoked an erosion and actually just like ninja did right and that's not something that you really expect but again turtling just dealing the mnf rule try to stay away from it there are times and places for it but most of the time it's just going to lose you so try and do um the other stuff that i talked about which is like ward up take smart fights play passive play smart uh, fight at choke points, defend towers, use smokes, bait, do all those other things, and you will find yourself winning a lot more than you actually do. Some people criticize criticize my play for being too passive, but I, I I'm trying to make the opponent 
make bad decisions, trying to make some space. That's what that's what they call it. They like space created, which is again a really abstract concept, and I'm trying to shy away from that. But regardless, no turtle. Say no to turtling. No, no turtles. Okay, I found this really awesome image on Google Image. But anyways, thanks everybody for watching. Uh, again.